My name is Alicia Starr. I work for Avondale University and I'm part of the planning committee organising OA Week this year in Australasia. Welcome to the session, How to Address Global Challenges with Open Science. Just some logistics before we start. Please keep the microphone muted, turn off your camera unless speaking, and type your questions into the chat. We will read out and respond at the end. This talk will be recorded and made available on the Open Access Australasia website. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia, including the traditional owners of the unceded lands on which I live and work in the Hunter region in New South Wales, the Awabakal people. I pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging for all First Nations peoples, wherever they are located. I also acknowledge our Maori, Pacifica, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues who are joining us today from across Aotearoa and Australia. I'd like to invite you to acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands on which you live and work in the chat. I'm pleased to introduce our panellists, Dr Nicole Kearney, Dr. Blair Truman and Bill Flynn, with Chair Dr. Ginny Barber facilitating. They'll be discussing diverse approaches to addressing global challenges with open science, including how we can adapt what we've learned from research during COVID to the climate emergency. So with that, I'll hand over to Ginny. Great, thank you very much, Alicia, and welcome everybody to this session. Um, we're really delighted to be hosting uh, a very f uh, a diverse and uh, fa f a fantastic panel today. Um, I, I want to just uh, really set the scene that you know we've we've we're, we're all living through uh, we're living through a global pandemic at the moment, and I think in many ways that's shown the absolute critical importance of open science in uh, addressing global challenges. But obviously, we're we're now facing a much bigger global challenge ahead of us in the in the form of climate science and I'm really keen for us to be thinking about how we can help open science uh, help with open science addressing that challenge going forward um, I'm going to introduce all the speakers together um, and then we'll have short presentations from each of them and then we'll have an opportunity for some questions including from the floor so please as Alicia said uh, type your questions into the chat and we will keep an eye on them and, um, and pose, pose, pose them afterwards so, um, just in order of uh, speaking, our first uh, speaker is going to be Nicole Kearney, who is uh, the Biodiversity Heritage Library, uh, manages the Biodiversity Heritage Library in the Australian branch of that, um, which is the world's largest online repository of open access biodiversity literature. She has the best pictures always, and she does an absolutely fabulous job of championing um, the biodiversity heritage uh, literature and uh, images in a way that I think really su also supports um, openness more generally and I, I've been very kind of taken with the way that she's used that in sort of advocacy. Um, our second speaker is going to be Dr Blair Truin, who's a senior Australian climate scientist. Um, he's the lead author of chapter two of the recent IPC, IPCC six assessment report, the changing state of the climate system. Uh, he's a member of the World Meteorological Organization's expert team on climate monitoring assessment, um, which relies heavily on international data access and exchange. And we're, um, has, he's spoken uh, recently about the most recent IPCC report. And our third speaker will be Bill Flynn, who's a, a, a skilled educator and passionate sustainability advocate, developing and managing SARO's Sustainable Futures Programme. He's come here from the Australian Citizen Science Association meeting, which is also going on this week. All the great meetings are going on this week. Um, he's the country coordinator for the GLOW Programme, which is a NASA-sponsored environmental citizen science programme. And his role includes advising and supporting teachers and the wider community in implementing the programme and other GLOBE offerings. So a really fascinating and diverse panel. Um, so we'll start with Nicole. And Nicole, if you'd like to um, share your screen. Fantastic, thank you. Thanks everyone. Um, and thank you, Ginny, for that very kind um, introduction. I'm a big fan of yours too. Um, and it's lovely to be speaking here today. So thank you for inviting me. Um, hello everyone. Um, I'm Nicole Carney, 
as Jimmy said, I'm speaking to you from Melbourne, where I manage the Australian branch of the Biodiversity Heritage Library. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which I work, the Boon Wurrung and the Woiwurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation. The Biodiversity Heritage Library is the world's largest virtual library of biodiversity heritage literature and archival materials. The project exists because the cultivation of natural science cannot be efficiently carried on without reference to an extensive library. This is a quote from Charles Darwin, and I'm sure Darwin would agree that access to an extensive library about biodiversity is critical to our understanding of our current climate crisis, and that now more than ever, when the majority of the world's libraries are closed, it's essential that we can access our library materials online, and more importantly, that these materials are open access. The project is a global consortium of over 500 libraries around the world, digitising their biodiversity literature and making it available online. Together, these libraries have digitised over 59 million pages from more than 274,000 volumes. And this incredible resource contains information on millions and millions and millions of the world's species. Australia joined the project in 2010. Funded by the Atlas of Living Australia, we started with just one organisation, Museums Victoria. Museums Victoria is the largest museum organisation in the Southern Hemisphere, and it has an impressive suite of venues. But this is our library. I use this photo a lot when I talk about the Biodiversity Heritage Library because for me it really captures why the project exists. Like most museum libraries, it's closed to the public, hidden away behind the scenes. So for our project, open access really begins here. Behind those doors are incredible treasures and those treasures include these three wonderful librarians, but also an incredible collection of rare books and historic journals, the foundation of our understanding of biodiversity. However, only a tiny fraction of our books are ever put on display. This is the first volume of Gould's The Birds of Australia. If you go to the Melbourne Museum, you can see this one page of this spectacular seven volume publication behind glass, when the museum is open that is. Melbourne's been in lockdown for longer than any other city in the world. So it's a good thing we have a digitized copy of this publication on BHL, openly accessible for everyone, everywhere. Since 2010, we've grown considerably. There are now 38 Australian organisations contributing in Australia to the Biodiversity Heritage Library. We're now a truly national project, representing every state and territory in the country. These organisations include our major state and territory museums, herbaria and government agencies, as well as smaller organisations, such as Royal Societies and Field Naturalist Clubs, who would never ever be resourced to do this work on their own. The publications of many of these organisations are available nowhere else online, and they often include invaluable information about biodiversity, such as this description of a new species of box jellyfish, published in the in-house journal of the Museum and Art Gallery of the Northern Territory. We get really enthusiastic feedback from grateful researchers when we post this content online, researchers who've not been able to access this content anywhere else until we uploaded it. We also receive requests to digitise material that relates specifically to conservation research, Last year, the Australian government gave grant money to researchers who were studying the impact of the 2020 bushfires on vulnerable species. We were contacted by a botanist focusing on native orchids who needed access to the descriptions and the distribution maps in this rare publication. She said, this is the information that we need to refer to when we're doing a conservation assessment of a species towards having it listed as vulnerable, endangered, or critically endangered. We've now digitised over 5,000 pages of this particular publication. So we put all this stuff online, job done right. But no, there's so much stuff now online, 59 million pages just on the BHL website. Just because something's open access doesn't mean it's discoverable. Most of my work involves making sure people can find what we put online because discoverability is a massive problem for historic literature. I studied zoology at university in the 1990s. Back then, if I wanted to research something, I went to the library. It took exactly the same amount of effort to find a brand new published article as it did a really, really old one. Things have changed. This new piece of research popped up in my Twitter feed. It's the announcement of the discovery of a new species of pygmy seahorse. In the tweet is a DOI, a digital object identifier. I can click on that DOI and it takes me directly through to the primary literature. If I want to know more about pygmy seahorses, I scroll down to the reference list and there are more DOIs. And I can click on all these other DOIs and I can read all those papers without reading my deck. But there are DOIs missing in that list. The old papers don't have DOIs. And that keeps me awake at night because now that it's so easy to read and find recently published articles, researchers are much more likely to read and to cite the new stuff. The historic literature is in danger of falling into obscurity. 
The vast majority of historic literature lacks DOIs and it sits outside our linked network of scholarly research. So if we want the historic literature to be both discoverable and persistently citable, it needs DOIs. 2020 provided an opportunity to do something about this. With our scanning operation completely shut down and our staff and our volunteers working from home, we couldn't make more content accessible. And so we switched focus to making our existing content more discoverable. I launched a global BHL working group to retrospectively assign persistent identifiers to the world's biodiversity literature. Team Retropids brings together the knowledge and expertise of librarians, programmers, metadata specialists, persistent identifier experts, and BHL super users. I then set my BHL Australia team to gathering, gap filling, and checking article level metadata. This is by far the most time consuming part of the process, and much of this tedious work was undertaken by our amazing volunteers who contacted me the day that we went into lockdown asking for work that they could do virtually. They're incredible. In our first year, we retrospectively assigned DOIs to over 10,000 articles, bringing this historic knowledge into the linked network of scholarly research. This is one of those most significant articles. It's the very first published scientific description of the platypus from 1799, and it contains the very first published illustration of this species. When I tweeted what we'd done in October 2020, I got some really enthusiastic responses. Both the idea of this and its content are absolutely brilliant. Links like this are essential for citations and cross-referencing. This is really cool because it follows that the web of citations becomes so much more complete. And now we need this for every other species. And put most simply, retropids are such a fantastic idea. According to Outmetric, the platypus's new retrospectively assigned DOI has now been mentioned in 331 tweets, seven Wikipedia pages, a blog post, a news story, and three academic papers. I've been actively tracking the performance of this new DOI and I get notified of its research output. I was super chuffed when it was cited in an academic paper last year using that brand new DOI. But then I was blown away when I was notified this year that it had suddenly been cited in a publication from 1990 and another from 1995, over 20 years before we'd minted the DOI. It turns out that the publishers of these 1990s articles, Oxford Academic and Elsevier, had rerun their citation indexing, which resulted in our retrospectively assigned DOIs being retrospectively linked to old citations. This totally made my year, and it sent me down a rabbit hole looking for other examples of this. This is one of the first DOIs that BHL assigned to a title to Audubon's Birds of America. So this DOI has been around since 2012. The earliest citation of this publication picked up by DOI tracking was in 1858. The definitive version of that 1858 article, the one with the DOI, is this one. It's not on BHL, it's on Springerlink. They've put the DOI version of this out of copyright article behind a paywall. You can buy a PDF of their copy of this article for 35, 35 euro, or you can click on that green unlock symbol there, which tells you that Unpaywall has found an open access version of this article elsewhere. Clicking on that button will take you through to BHL's copy. Unpaywall was able to find BHL's open access version of this article because wherever DOIs already exist, we add them to our article data on BHL. We've now added 62,000 external DOIs to BHL and we're gonna keep on adding them. I'm assuming that most people listening will have heard of Unpaywall. In case you haven't, it's a massive database of over 30 million free scholarly articles with an extension that enables users to click from paywalled articles to legally open access versions. There was a discussion in Thomas's previous session about university academics not even noticing that paywall, paywalls exist because university academics just get automatic access to everything. But for the rest of us, Unpaywall is an essential tool for accessing biodiversity content. This is another really significant piece of biodiversity literature for which the DOI version is behind the paywall. This is the first published description of Leadbeater's possum from 1867. You can get a copy of this one for 53 US dollars for 48 hours access. Again, clicking on that green unlock symbol will take you to our open access version. Again, because we've provided that critical DOI. The Leadbeater's possum is close to my heart because it's the faunal emblem for my home state of Victoria. It's also critically endangered, which means that open access to information about its past distribution and abundance is critical for conservation efforts, which is why we're doing what we're doing. Thank you for listening. Oh, for some reason it's not going to my final slide. There we are. Thank you for that. 
Thank you, Nicole. That was a fantastic presentation. I'm a huge fan of persistent identifiers. And I, I think that, uh, you know, it not only is it the case for the type of work that you're doing, I came across a when I was recently looking for a um, the first description of DNA, the Watson Crick paper is also behind a paywall. It's absolutely astonishing. <laughs> kind of when, I started, are... when I started this work, the uh, um, Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace's article about natural selection by um, was also behind a pay, which is possibly the most significant piece of biodiversity literature ever published. Yeah, thank it's you. a fantastic uh, way of raising awareness about this. So thank you. All right, great. We'll now go on to, to Blair. Thank you very much you to share your screen. Help if I unmute myself. Are you seeing that okay? Yes, we are. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. And uh, it's a really interesting uh, uh, presentation from Nicole. And uh, yeah, some of the same issues apply in uh, in our field of climate as well. But uh, that's not what I'm here to talk about. What I'm here to talk about is uh, uh, more looking at uh, uh, how the open exchange of data uh, internationally supports international meteorology and international climate science. Uh, and uh, some of the barriers that, uh, that still remain and uh, some of what's being done to address those. Uh, so uh, fundamentally, atmospheric science relies on data from uh, all around the world. The atmosphere and the ocean know no national borders and uh, uh, doing a weather forecast uh, for anything other than the very short term is effectively impossible without access to data from other parts of the world. Uh, and uh, the map I've got below, just uh, uh, you know, picking out one, one day from last week, uh, showing everywhere from where observations uh, uh, were, observed, were, were obtained by the global system. So you can see that there's uh, uh, yeah, coverage of uh, many parts of the world, some gaps, of course, but uh, uh, but most uh, countries are reporting. Uh, and uh, that uh, owes a great deal to a structure that's been uh, uh, in place for many decades now for the free exchange of uh, international meteorological data. Uh, uh, and this is uh, done through a platform managed by the World Meteorological Organization, uh, which is a specialized UN agency. Uh, and that was established, uh, I think, from memory in 1949, just after the Second World War at any rate. And uh, one of the fundamental things about this system is that uh, uh, countries uh, uh, submit their data into this system and it's available for, uh, for anyone to use, whether that's uh, uh, other countries' meteorological services or uh, multinational institutions like some of the big weather modelling centres uh, or just uh, uh, you know, any other institution or individual who, uh, who knows how to make use of the data. Uh, and that uh, structure has stayed pretty robust uh, ever since. Uh, you know, there are some countries which uh, uh, you're know, either not taking observations or aren't capable of transmitting observations to the outside world. And you can see some uh, you know, holes in the data in places like Afghanistan or parts of Africa. Uh, but generally speaking, it's held up well. And that's even true uh, you know, through periods such as the Cold War uh, or you know, countries like the USSR and China were still uh, regularly contributing to this. In fact, they are probably amongst the most reliable contributors. Now, this was uh, very much set up around the needs of weather forecasting. So it was very much focused on uh, exchange of data uh, uh, in real time uh, at a particular time. Uh, there was also a system put in place for the exchange of monthly averages, which is uh, what a lot of climate data sets are built on. Uh, but until the last uh, 30 years or so, uh, climate has been a secondary priority and that's reflected in uh, uh, some of the issues which I'll come to a little bit later on. Um, and that's reflected in the fact that some data types aren't as available as others. So the map on the left, which is drawing from the monthly data I just mentioned, uh, shows how far global temperatures were above or below average uh, in August. And you can see here that it's uh, most, you know, most of the world is covered. There are, you know, again, gap, gaps, particularly in Africa, where there's a lack of uh, observations available. Uh, and uh, there are gaps in uh, the Southern Ocean and Antarctic, where we just aren't all that many places doing observations. But generally, the coverage is pretty good. 
But the map on the right, which is showing the percentage of uh, very warm days in 2020, you can see there that uh, there's you know, decent coverage in uh, Eurasia, North America and Australia, but not much anywhere else. And uh, the reason for that is that that's draw that's drawing on daily data and it requires uh, uh, access to historical sets of daily data. And those types of data uh, up until now generally haven't been freely exchanged through these systems. So it's been up to the uh, individual countries to decide what they make available. And there are a number of reasons why observations aren't reaching the outside world. Uh, the most obvious one is that observations were never made in the first place. Another is that observations were made but aren't being communicated to the outside world. Um, uh, a third uh, is that, uh, for his, particularly for historical observations, is that uh, uh, the observations uh, were made and are recorded on paper uh, but have never been digitised. In this context, I'm referring, I use the word digitisation to mean that the numbers are being entered into a database uh, uh, as opposed to just the documents being imaged. Uh, uh, another one which you sometimes get is that the data is available in a database at the national level, but there's uh, a lack of resources to deliver it to the outside world. And then the final one, and one I'll discuss a bit more, is uh, uh, that uh, historical observations are available at the national level, but aren't made widely available for a number of reasons, which I'll discuss a bit later on. But looking at the observations on paper issue, and uh, what we refer to in our field as data rescue. Um, you know, a lot of historical observations uh, uh, are on paper and need to be uh, uh, put into a database. That's a very resource intensive exercise as you might expect. And it's, uh, it's an activity that uh, uh, you know, not many uh, national meteorological services uh, have uh, resources to do. Uh, but there have been uh, some very uh, uh, effective projects, uh, citizen science projects, uh, which have generally been on the basis of uh, uh, having image documents and then citizen science volunteers transcribe the numbers and enter them uh, uh, into a database. And those have been available for, uh, for broad use. The example I've put up here is, uh, uh, is an observation journal from Adelaide in 1844. Uh, now, the observation journals at Adelaide from uh, before 1887, uh, so before it uh, you know, became officially under the auspices of uh, first the South Australian government and then the Bureau of Meteorology after Federation. But before that, uh, those records hadn't been digitised and uh, uh, a num large number of citizen science volunteers have now digitised these records. And we've been able to use these to uh, construct what's now the longest uh, uh, single climate record for any location in Australia and one of the longest in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, well, it's interesting, actually, Nicole mentioning, you know, making good use of lockdown periods. And, uh, you know, one really nice example of that was that there had been a citizen science project set up some time ago in the UK to, uh, to digitise the uh, uh, old British rainfall records because a lot of the pre-1960 British rainfall record, daily rainfall records were only available on paper and they'd made making fairly slow progress for a while and uh, uh, you know, thought it would take years for them to complete and they got a bit of media publicity at the start of the first British lockdown and that you know, really engaged people who at that time didn't have an awful lot to do and uh, it turned out what they were expecting to, to take years to do got done within a few weeks. The final one I'll uh, touch on is what uh, data policy issues there are in different parts of the world and there's uh, you know, quite a number of reasons why uh, some countries choose not to make their data available. Um, the first one, which is probably not as big as you might think, is uh, the perceived commercial value of the data. Um, generally speaking, countries that are using that as, uh, as a pretext uh, are developing countries where there are really very few alternative sources of revenue for the National Meteorological Service. And uh, that's recognised as a problem. And uh, uh, you know, just in the last uh, few months, the uh, WMO has set up what they call the Systematic Observations Financing Facility. And essentially that's a platform where foreign aid donors can uh, uh, donate funds and those can be made available for developing countries to support their you know, observing networks. So that means then they don't have to uh, uh, raise revenue by trying to sell their data and usually not succeeding. 
Um, an issue in some countries is what I'll, what I'll describe as cultural views of the value of information. Uh, and what I yeah, mean here is that uh, uh, yeah, uh, those of you who have, who have dealt with uh, Indigenous communities will be well aware, for example, that Indigenous communities have uh, often have very strict rules about uh, uh, who has access to traditional information. Uh, and uh, of some time, in some countries, uh, that spills over into uh, uh, you know, attitudes towards the availability of uh, you know, more you know, non-traditional non information as well. And that, that's certainly a challenge when dealing with countries like the Pacific Island countries, where uh, a high weight of uh, importance is placed on traditional knowledge that uh, uh, you know, open access to other forms of knowledge you know, can be quite challenging to negotiate in uh, uh, in those types of countries as well. Another thing which fits into those categories is uh, uh, countries that uh, uh, you know, feel quite strongly about national data sovereignty. Uh, sometimes it's just an institutional culture issue. Uh, you know, there are quite a number of countries where uh, in government meteorology is the responsibility of the military or the you know, Ministry of Defence or equivalent, which uh, I think it'd be fair to say organisations which uh, uh, you know, aren't particularly culturally attuned to openness of information. So that uh, yeah, can be a cultural problem as well. And then you, you get uh, governments that just have a restrictive view of government information generally, uh, uh, sometimes because they're countries that uh, uh, would prefer pesky journalists not to be inquiring too much as to why a few hundred million dollars uh, disappeared from the treasury into a Swiss bank account, which might or might not be connected with the president. Uh, uh, but leaving all of those issues aside, uh, uh, just in the last week, there has been a WMO meeting, which, uh, which all countries were uh, entitled to be represented, which agreed to a, a new WMO data policy. And uh, part of that data policy is effectively to, uh, uh, to make uh, much of that historical data open. Uh, you know, it is uh, something that still uh, you know, needs to be implemented and uh, you know, there's still some things can go wrong in the implementation, but uh, you know, that's a huge step forward in, uh, uh, in open data access and um, uh, you know, I've, really quite excited at the uh, uh, potential that that will open over the next uh, few years and uh, yeah, will hopefully allow us to do a particularly much better assessment of what's happening with climate extremes uh, uh, for the next IPCC report than, uh, uh, than what was possible for this one. Okay, so I'll uh, stop sharing there. Great, thank you, Blair. That's really fascinating, and I'm really, it's really interesting the way that you uh, talked about how the digitized the historical data was digitized during the pandemic in the same way that Nicole Nicole's uh, records also got a sort of um, a boost. Um, I think there's a really interesting kind of intersection there between make who, who's interested in making these data available. Um, great. Well, um, I'll now pass on to Bill for the uh, for the last presentation. Bill, if you'd like to share your screen. Oh, you're just muted at the moment, Bill. <laughs> there we go. That was Perfect. That. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, start again. So before I get started proper, I'd also like to acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the lands where I'm located here in Adelaide in South Australia. So I suppose a little about me before I get started. I'm going to talk about the GLOBE program in particular, but I've got a, a if you like, a mixed background as an industrial chemist originally. And I suppose at some point saw the error of my ways and found myself in education. So I've been in uh, senior school teaching senior school students for around 15 years and currently with CSIRO Education and Outreach and been with CSIRO for the past 10 years. So the GLOBE program has been around since 1995, and I think was the, the idea originally of Al Gore, and Al Gore approached NASA uh, to see if they could get, the, the, I suppose, the public more generally involved in data collection uh, and appreciate some of the work that the scientists were doing right then. So we were approached in 2019 by the Australian Space Agency to form a partnership 
to, uh, if you like, reinvigorate the program because it, you could still be involved in the program, uh, but we didn't have, if you like, an official presence here in Australia. So we were approached, as I said, by the space agency. Uh, the space agency, like CSIRO, where possible, like to engage with the public as much as we, as we can. And one of the ways that the space agency saw the value of the GLOBE program was that, you know, if, if thinking about it, most of the work that they do is around collecting data in one form or another. And the GLOBE program is essentially around collecting environmental data, but to engage with the broader public. So the program is, I suppose, is, is built around the four Earth spheres, and you can see the spheres up there. Within those spheres are what we call protocols. So the protocols are, have been developed by NASA scientists with the intention that because NASA scientists can't be there when the citizens are collecting the, the scientific data, but by providing them with a, a rigorous scientific methodology, they can, as much as they possibly can, uh, guarantee, and I use the term caution with a lot of caution, guarantee that the, the accuracy and the reliability of their data. Of course, NASA run algorithms to check the data, and if there are other tolerances, then often the, the data that's been collected is, is goes through a, a rigorous filtering process. So it's a really good way, I suppose, of getting students involved in, in collecting data. And I think for me, as an ex-school teacher, what it does as well, it, it, it gets students actually in, in their environment, collecting environmental data. So outside the classroom, with the sleeves rolled up, if you like, collecting data, being, I suppose, more appreciative of the environment, not just their local environment around them, but the global environment. And how these spheres are actually interlinked uh, and, and not independent, don't work independently of each other. So at last count, we had 126 countries that are now registered to the program and close to 38,000 schools across those 126 countries. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, some of the options in a moment or two, but uh, the two, if you like, the two prongs to the program, the two main prongs, one is, is to engage directly through a mobile phone app. And the mobile phone app currently has 200, around 214,000 users of the Globe Observer app. So you can see it's considerable reach to this program. On the database itself, there are well over 200 million measurements now that have been collected since then. And in this month alone, given the fact that you know, most people are, are impacted in one way or another by COVID. We've close to a million and a half measurements have been submitted uh, this month alone. So as I mentioned, the program, you got uh, three options essentially, but I like to consider when I'm talking to people, just to, to I suppose, encourage them to, to consider two options really. So the option with the three images on the left, you can see the option there is, is the actual, the GLOBE program itself. So in the GLOBE program itself, what happens is that uh, students and teachers, teachers register to the program and then go through a, a training process. So the idea is that they familiarize themselves with the, pro, with the protocol and the sphere, and then they have an online assessment. So you can't just register and go out there and collect data. I suppose you've got to prove that you have a, a level of knowledge and competence to be able to do that. Uh, and then that allows you to go out and collect data purely for that protocol. So if you, if you wanted to collect data from a number of different protocols, then an educator, ideally a teacher, would complete those protocols and then that puts them in a position to go out and collect data. Once they've registered, they can create student accounts. So they can have students collect data individually if they like, or they can supply the, the students with a, a common login so that if you have a group of say 25 students, each student can, can contribute to that single data set if you like, or they can contribute as individuals. So the e is fairly straightforward. Uh, and that's one of the things that I often give teachers guidance and support with. The other option is to use the Globe Observer app. And I suppose the Observer app is, is more directly targeted at citizen scientists. So people that might not necessarily be engaged in science in a traditional way. Uh, but the beauty of the app is you, you have almost a, a, a a systematic approach to data collection. So it leads you through a protocol, but it leads you through a protocol using a number of images. So again, I suppose the advantage to that is if English is a second language, by following graphical prompts, you can still be involved in, in data collection uh, and supplying data that's potentially going to be used by scientists 
uh, and other citizen scientists, of course, and most definitely using education establishments. The great thing about the Observer app is it also gives the opportunity to engage with other citizen scientists in as much as the, the person that sets up the, the account, if you like, becomes the administrator of the, of the account. And they have control then over who comes and goes and who contributes data. And I know we're all mindful of, of uh, data security and particularly online usage, but especially if, if young people are involved in this. So NASA have gone to great lengths to uh, make these things se as secure as they possibly can. And the only person that sees any information of members that have actually joined is the administrator. So if a teacher or a family member, uh, and in, in some cases, the scouts have used this, uh, and they ran a campaign in 2019 where they were collecting land cover data. So the administrator that sets up that, what they do is they supply potential members with a referral code, and that person, all, all they need is an email address and that referral code, and they can then join the team. Now, the administrator has an option when they set up the team, they can set up a team that's a close team. And what that does is once that team's set up, then no one else will be, is allowed to, to actually join the team unless they're given permission by the administrator. Or they can set up an open team. And that means that anyone nationally and internationally can contribute to that team. So if you have a particular interest and you come across a GLOBE team using the GLOBE Observer app and it's an open team, then you can contribute data to that team's uh, data collection efforts. The third option is... Uh, a set of a fairly comprehensive set of classroom activities. And a lot of the classroom activities are almost a, a soft introduction to the protocols, but there's no registration required for that. So anyone can actually go on there and, and use the classroom activities. So we've had a lot of teachers are going on there and, and have been using those activities during, uh, during lockdown while they've been homeschooling. Uh, but ideally, uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to if you like, embed the program into school curriculum so that teachers integrate the use of GLOBE and data, local environmental data collection into their teaching programs. And, and as I said, the, the, the two options for teachers to do this will be to register and actually set up a, an account uh, and use that in their school where students are collecting data. They can collect data outside the school, of course, uh, but using the GLOBE Observer app is another option for teachers. So those, if you like, are the three options. The other thing as well that, that GLOBE do to, I suppose, to try and maintain interest, because as I'm sure most people are aware that citizen science, interest in citizen science tends to, to wane somewhat, depending on uh, what the program is. And often these programs run for a short period. So what the GLOBE development team do is they frequently will organize challenges. So here's an example of two challenges that have run quite recently. So these have run this year. So one of the challenges was the mosquito habitat photo challenge. So these are run, well, this one in particular runs, was run through the Globe Observer app. And even though you can collect Moscow mosquito habitat data ongoing, so this is an ongoing program, I suppose to generate a lot of interest. Uh, and in this particular case, this was done as the NASA scientists for the, who were responsible for the particular program were encouraging people, individual citizen scientists to go out and collect mosquito habitat photographs so they can actually identify the species of mosquito. The idea being that what they're hoping to do is develop some AI so that they can then identify based on the uh, material that's been supplied to them, where there's likely to be vector-borne disease from these, so such as dengue fever and Zika. So that's, uh, if you like, a, a, one of the uh, challenges that was developed by the NASA scientists that ran for, the, typically these will run for a month, and I think this probably ran around May, August this year. Uh, no, before then, June, June, July time, I believe. And then the, the Community Cheese Challenge, again, was a, a student-centered challenge, uh, but this was available through the Globe Observer app or through the Globe program proper where you can actually go and identify using some simple geometry to, to uh, calculate tree heights uh, or using the Globe Observer app to calculate tree heights. And this data, again, is useful for ground truth in satellites. So at a glance, uh, using satellites, they can then try and identify land change and land use. So again, you know, we all appreciate that areas are being impacted by climate change. So by combining 
ground truthing images from citizen scientists and satellite images, then that sort of, I suppose, reinforces we can see what's happening out there in the environment. So those are two uh, examples of uh, citizen science challenges. Uh, the other one that ran, and, and, and again, this is an ongoing thing. So often these uh, are developed to engage students so that students can actually submit a, uh, if you like, a scientific paper or some kind of experimental paper. And during the year, once a year, they have a virtual science symposium where students can actually talk about the projects that they've submitted uh, to, a, if you like, a professional audience. So I'm sure we're all familiar with Urban Heat Island. So again, NASA through the GLOBE program ran this Urban Heat Island campaign where here we get students out, not just in the cities and the uh, heavily populated metropolitan areas, but they can actually do this kind of investigation around their school grounds. So this run, uh, well, and again, this is ongoing. So the idea is that I think it's during three or four times of the year for one week, students go out there and collect data on a daily basis. And then that data is collected globally uh, and scientists can use that data again to see what's happening to the global climate. So students in this particular place recorded cloud data, air temperature, surface temperature uh, for five days during the period of October, December and March. One of the challenges, I suppose, with most citizen science campaigns is, you know, first of all, getting students or citizen scientists involved. And, and, and again, I can speak from my personal experiences is the value. What's the impact? Why I'm actually doing this? So one of the ways that NASA and the GLOBE team have tried to address that is by giving feedback. So when, when citizen scientists collect their data, they can actually view their data on the uh, visualized uh, platform. And they, if you go onto the GLOBE website, you can see this data. And this is represented in a number of different ways. So it, it could be represented by graphics. So with particularly with things like the trees campaign, you can actually see photographs that have been taken by citizen scientists from different areas around the world. All that data is also available as a, as a CSV. So you can download the, the raw data from that as well. Uh, as I said, two, 2 million measurements on there. So, there's a lot of photographs on there, trust me. You, you probably, if you're going on there and you're wanting the data, it's probably better to, to use the either the advanced programming interface or the download option through CSV. One of the ways that NASA, I suppose, and, and GLOBE try to maintain that interest, uh, and they've done this through the GLOBE Observer with one of the options in particular with the clouds observation, is if you time your clouds observation uh, within 15 minutes of a satellite overpass, you get a physical email from NASA confirming the accuracy or otherwise of your observation against the satellite observation. Uh, so again, you know, it leads you through the process. So it's a stepwise process. And the idea is that you would take photographs from the four, from north, south, east and west, one vertical and one down looking down at the ground and then NASA use that image so again they use that run algorithms to compare that data with the data that they get from particular satellites so there's a number of different I suppose options through the GLOBE program uh, in the space of 10 minutes quite honestly it's difficult to do the program justice because it is quite a massive program with as, as you can see, a considerable number of participants and a considerable number of measurements over the years. So what I would suggest you do is, is if you are interested, if you go to the GLOBE webpage and you can see the websites up there, so this is what you will see, uh, and go into the GLOBE program. Again, you can access all the information, all the data that's on there uh, without actually having to register in any form. The only time that you need to register is if you're going to use the Globe Observer app, and then you would register using an email address. That's all you need. And you can register as an individual observer, or you can set up a team, as I mentioned earlier, or you can complete the protocol training, uh, particularly if you're in an education establishment. So this program runs from K or through to, uh, I suppose, higher education. Some universities use it, particularly in Asia, so Thailand. Taiwan and India, it's quite popular in their uh, universities for year one and year two environmental science students. Uh, but that's ideally. And the, the other, I suppose, appeal is that because it is a global community, 
people that are registered have the opportunity to collaborate with other teachers and other establishments. So I suppose it's a, uh, again, you know, a, a way of getting people and individuals to appreciate, you know, not only their environment, but the environment and the challenges that other countries face, particularly as we now, I suppose, beginning to accept more broadly that climate change is an issue that we're, we're all going to have to address together. Thank you. Great, thank you, Bill. That's a really fascinating overview of, of this project that I hadn't heard about before. We we had the opportunity to to meet and talk about this, and I've just seen that somebody in the chat has uh, noted that they've already downloaded the app and <laughs> already getting on. We'll be doing some contributing to it. So thank you. Um, so I thank you everyone for those those talks. They they were really diverse, but I think actually showed the, the power of, the, I guess, the sort of global community of science, whether it be citizen scientists, whether it be, you know, librarians um, who are digitizing content, whether it be um, the kind of what d data that Blair was talking about, which is collected globally and sort of really addressing a sort of massive global problem. So I just wondered if I could um, just kick off by um, asking you to um, perhaps reflect on, um, if we're thinking about the sort of the global issue of climate science, climate more generally, the, the climate crisis we're facing. If you were to have a sort of wish list of things you'd like to see more invest, investment and effort in in your area, what would that be in sort of helping us think about the future of, um, of climate? And perhaps I might just start with Blair, given all the work that you've done. OK, well, yeah, if, you know, to start with all, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, uh, define this specifically in terms of uh, you know, inve investment in the underlying science. Uh, obviously, very much broader issues about uh, uh, you know, investments in uh, uh, solutions for reducing uh, emissions, but uh, I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll uh, leave that as something for another time. But as far as in you know, investments in the uh, you know, observational science that I deal with, I think that uh, uh, you know, fundamentally uh, it's uh, you know, in, investment in better observations in uh, in developing countries, and uh, you know we've got a you know starting to see a platform for that now. But uh, uh, you know, there's clearly a lot of work to do to be able to set up uh, sustainable observation systems and to and to maintain them. Because one of you know one of the problems we've found historically is that uh, uh, it's relatively easy to get donor funds to set up an observations network, but uh, uh, but uh, not so easy to get funds to maintain it. And we've seen far too many cases where, uh, you know, good systems which look would have been set up and then they've stopped functioning within a few years. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think, I think that's kind of a, a challenge across the entirety of any project that uh, gets set up. Nicole, what from your point of view, what would you like to see more investment in and what, what that might, how that might uh, address sort of climate change more globally? Um, my brain jumped to the same first things that we need more government investment in everything to do with reducing emissions. Um, I'm so extraordinarily frustrated in the Australian government's lack of investment in this area. Specifically related to my project, um, I think for us, we rely extremely heavily on OCR to make the content discoverable, finding all that, um, finding all that article data. We're often downloading kind of um, OCR from old texts that needs improvement. Um, but particularly also the, um, the uptake of our, DOIs and the links that we're creating by, say, the, the taxonomic databases such as the Atlas Living Australia or, um, or globally, um, um, the Global Biodiversity Information Framework to try and GBIF, to try and incorporate our DOIs into those, to try and create that kind of linked network of scholarly research between taxonomic names and the, and the species descriptions in our literature. Great. Thank you, Nicole. Bill, what about you? Where would you like to see more investment going in your, your area? Yeah, it's the bridging. I think I think there's a there's a disconnect between what's happening in schools and what's happening in the real world. Uh, and working for CSIRO, we, we we've made considerable progress in encouraging scientists to actually engage more with the public. Uh, and certainly, our comms people work with uh, traditional science, and, and I suppose present that in a way that is is palatable to the general public. And I think the thing that's that struck me over the last few years that, you know, we, we now, and certainly when I did my degree, you know, there wasn't such a thing as science communication as a degree option. And I think we've, we've become more aware of the need to communicate science to the general public so that 
we have, and one of our, I suppose, goals for cyber education and outreach is, is to have a scientifically literate community, you know, and I think that way that people can make non-biased opinion judgment based on, you know, a variety of opinions that they get bombarded with. So I think more investment in communicating that science in a way that the general public that don't have a, a, a scientific background can understand and appreciate. Thanks, Bill. Actually, that's a question I was going to lead on to. So perhaps for both for Blair and Nicole, what, what do you think the role of, you know, how, how should we be sort of interacting with the public when we're talking about the work that you're doing and how important is that in, in kind of increasing understanding in, in the science in this area? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, having engagement with the public is uh, important, and uh, uh, you know, in, in one sense, we're fortunate in that. Uh, you know, the you know, the weather is the ultimate cliche. It's a topic for small talk conversation, and everybody, uh, uh, you know, is aware of it, and uh, but they don't, aren't necessarily aware of how it's placed into context. Uh, uh, but it's yeah, it is a field where it's relatively straight straightforward to get the public interested at uh, finding a way to uh, channel their interest into something constructive. But, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Nicole, with regard to your work, you, um, I, I just, I'm sort of very aware that, you know, a lot of the work you're doing is really highlighting the, the visibility of these species. Did you think that has a direct effect on um, interest in support for conservation and um, et cetera? Um, no, I really do. I mean, so much information about past distribution and abundance is locked up in these historic texts, um, sort of specifically relating to your previous question about the public. Um, we're working incredibly hard um, to try and get links to our historic literature into places like Wiki, Wikipedia. Um, and in fact, assigning DOIs to that content makes it really easy to incorporate a reference into Wikipedia. You just have to dump the DOI and it pulls the reference in. But that's where people go for information. Like the general public and the students are not going to go and try and find information on Leadbeater's possums in the Biodiversity Heritage Library or perhaps even places like the Ants of Living Australia. They're going to go look it up on Google. Google will send it to Wikipedia. So we need to put, we need to incorporate everything we're doing with the places where people are looking for it and the places that our search engines are sending people. So that's a big part of our work too. Yep. I, I'm going to do a quick plug for a session that we've got on Friday, which is about communicating science. So um, perhaps this might be a conversation that we can carry on there. Um, we're almost at the end, but I just want to just finish with one quick thought, uh, question from each of you. I mean, we, obviously open science became incredibly important during the pandemic. Um, do you think that we can build, what could we take perhaps from the pandemic and the understanding of the importance of science and open science in, in your work and addressing um, the sort of climate more generally? Um, perhaps I'll kick off with Blair. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I thought the, uh, you know, one of the things the pandemic is, uh, has, you know, has really illustrated is uh, the number of people out there who are, uh, you know, really good at things like data visualisation and communication. And uh, if they have access to data, can uh, be really effective in communicating, uh, communicating it. Because, uh, uh, you know, a lot of scientists have, you know, quite enough to do themselves with uh, their research without getting out there into communication with others are willing to run with it. That's great. And, I, you know, I think it's really striking that, uh, you know, probably one of the, uh, you know, best uh, COVID data communication and outfits out there in Australia is run by three year nines in Melbourne. <laughs> that's exactly true. No, that's a great point. Yeah. Uh, Bill, Bill, what, what, would you, what would your lesson be, do you think? Yeah, I, I, I suppose a little like Blair. And, I, and I, th I think the hope for me is if, and I suppose this is, a, a, again, a, a self plug, is that we, if we can get, students and teachers using programs and not just like globe or the citizen science programs where they're freely contributing and sharing data then that almost becomes the norm i mean i worked in industry and and it, you know it was almost cloak and dagger you know what, what happened in the lab stayed in the lab you had a, a lab book and no one else saw your lab book apart from your line manager and you just think and even now you know i look at the citizen science programs that are running and there's a lot of duplicate programs. And I think at some point we'll actually start to collaborate and go, you know, everyone can use this information. You know, why, why have we got a multitude of people? And I know sometimes it's about grants and funding and, and it's quite a complex challenge, but I, I believe that working together and open access and citizen science hand in hand will resolve a lot of those issues. Thanks, Bill. Nicole, what about you for final thoughts, apart from getting all your librarians to work during, um, during the lockdown? Um, I mean, I think 
I, mean, I can't speak for the whole world here, but um, certainly for many people I've spoken to and for myself, it's been the, the pandemic has been a time to kind of step back and we haven't been able to do the usual work that we've done. We haven't just continued on that treadmill. So we've actually stepped back and kind of been able to look at our projects and, and what we're doing more broadly and say, you know, what could we do better? And, and you know, in some parts we haven't been able to do what we want to do, but we've worked out different ways of doing them. Um, and we've also seen globally that how a lot of environments and animals and plants have responded to the reduced pressure of, of people and um, and tourism and, and also global emissions. And I'm hoping that we can learn from that and perhaps take away some lessons. And we've, we've already seen this week, perhaps a, a movement in the right direction in Australia in terms of, of global emissions. I'm hoping that that kind of the good news keeps going. Um, but yes, I'm hoping that, that there is good news for our future and that perhaps the information that we're providing will assist with that. Great, thank you very much. Um, so look, it just it's just um, now up to me to thank you for a fantastic session, really diverse, but actually I think lots of links between all the work that you're all doing. Um, I, I really learned a lot from it and I, I'm sure that everybody else did. Um, I'll just remind the recording will be made available if you want to share with colleagues, that'll be on our Open Access Australasia website. Um, tomorrow we have a session on Indigenous Voices, Research Principles through a First Nations lens and I'd encourage you to register for that if you'd like. Um, thank you very much for joining us, enjoy the rest of Open Access Week and um, look forward to seeing you at another webinar, thank you.